It's an extremely busy time of year here on Bootleg. We have a bunch of interviews with prospects and a bunch of interviews with uh, other colleagues in the media. Today is one of our biggest interviews yet. Mina Kimes returning to Bootleg for the second straight year uh, to talk a little bit about the NFL draft. More specifically, five gems. I know we do the gem series here on Bootleg. Uh, We asked Mina to give her five gems of just guys she really likes to watch. But before we get to that interview, EJ, my friend, how are you? Best day ever. Mina back on Bootleg, bringing her unique perspective on this draft and these prospects uh she'll she'll let folks know why she thinks it's interesting to have all this cross-pollination we are extremely glad and privileged to have her on this show to share those takes because they're a little bit different than ours and a bunch of different players that we haven't talked about which is super fun for us so tremendous show couldn't be happier uh not going to waste any more of your time so without further ado let's get too many times It's early to mid-April now, which means this is the time of draft season where everybody's just going on everybody else's shows. Uh, I saw DJ went on the Mina Kime show, and I know Mina's going on DJ's show, and they're both coming on our show, so this is just the musical chairs part of the year. Mina Kimes, welcome to Bootleg. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I like that. I love the exchange of ideas and guests because... While we see a lot of things in the draft similarly, I I think there's some pretty key differences between everyone. So it's good to, you know, just kind of give listeners different viewpoints, especially on this quarterback class, by the way. Um, That was I've been really surprised at how differently everyone sees it, uh, which is fun. It's great for content. We'll consider it cross pollination for draft content, which you could desperately use. But before we dive into the meat of today's episode, I uh, wanted to get your thoughts on the class overall for the exact reason that you just stated. What do you think the strongest parts of this draft are and what do you think the weakest position group is? Yeah, this is one where I'm sure we all agree wide receiver and offensive tackle. Uh, I did. I've been doing these mock drafts on my uh, YouTube channel. Actually, they've been running on my podcast feed as mm-hmm. well. Uh, where I pick two and then the guest picks one. It's really fun. We just burn through it. And I had Nate Tyson, and I think we had 11 offensive linemen in the first round. <laughs> uh, offensive linemen, not tackles. So that includes sure. yeah. R. Johnson, you know, Grant Barton. But uh, it, as much as we are talking about this being a generational, you know, potentially record-breaking receiver class, I, I, I think people might be sleeping on how many offensive linemen are going to get drafted, which... Uh, matches well with need because there's a lot of teams that that need them so those are the two positions of strength as far as weakness goes um linebacker is probably the weakest one to me but that's you know feels like a bit of a multi-year trend at this point yeah the things that the league needs from that position have definitely changed and we see that sort of filtering down in the draft uh, in positions that are coming up and positions that aren't like inside linebacker all right a fun one for you before we get to your list because your list is plenty fun if you had to make up a slogan for the 2024 draft what would it be Mm, um i guess it would be take offense because this is such an offensive (laughs) draft i i mean i how many defensive players i'm sure you guys have been doing mocks like it, you, we did a draft where one of the players that I'm going to mention, whom I love, who's a pass rusher, who I think is so such a cool player, I think he dropped like into the late 20s, which mm-hmm. is wild. But it really is because we have so many offense. I, I've been at least mocking so many offensive players going so quickly in this draft. I, there might only be like two defenders that go in the top 15, maybe. I got asked yesterday, when was the last time we didn't have a defender in the top 10? And I was like, it's been a while. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I, will, I will say, though, if the Atlanta Falcons don't take a pass rusher, I might have to fly to Atlanta and shake it. Like, you, <laughs> somebody has to stop Terry Fontenot from taking another skill player. You, you just you can't do it, guys. You got to take a pass rusher. So, and fortunately for them, uh, they will certainly have their choice of it. I think the goal is, you know, don't hold people under 20. Just score more than 40 and dare them to to keep up. I don't know. We'll see. It worked in 2016. Um, Meat of the episode today. 
you know, we always do our 10 gem specials uh, for offensive defense. I got five gems. EJ's got five gems. We already did all those, but we want Mina's five gems. Uh, and you came up with a really, really interesting list. Some names that we've briefly mentioned, but uh, largely names that we haven't really talked about at all in this draft season, believe it or not. Uh, of course, you being a loyal Husky fan, you had to find a way to get a Washington Husky in there. Your first gem, Jalen Polk, receiver. You He's like still him? good. Uh, I mean, I, it's it's unbelievable how good they were. One, two, three. It's it's like when you go back and watch the tape. It, it, and I was a Huskies fan. This is probably the most fun. It definitely the most fun I've ever had watching a college football team in my lifetime. Uh, and yet, I didn't. I don't think I appreciated in the moment how good it was. And and the player that we're talking about, Jalen Polk, is one who missed a lot of the this season. And and I think that actually to me. Uh, reinforced how good he is when he came back and you saw the not, not a lot of season, but you saw the immediate impact on the offense um i so you know i it's funny because odunze they they actually have some similar qualities which is to say they both have absolutely unbelievable hands but with odunze who's obviously one of the three first wide receivers taken um you know, people view him as an obvious number one, and I think Jalen is not seen that way, and I get it. And he is probably more your, you know, prototypical wide receiver two or three in an offense. But to me, if he's your wide receiver two or three, you've got a great offense because uh, I think the hands are the calling card. The hands are what are going to get him drafted. The catch radius, the ability to make difficult catches in traffic. Um, but it's not just hands. It's body control. It's route running. He's so smart the way um, he attacks defenses. And I, I, he is like the type of prospect where I don't know where his ceiling is, but it's very hard for me to imagine a world in which he's not successful in the NFL because all of that to me translates at the next level. What do you think about like a Jacoby Myers comp for him? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um who is kind of like everything I just said you could use to describe Myers. I think Myers is probably, you know, a little bit more polished as a route runner. Obviously, uh, Polk um, is still developing in that regard. But, you know, both of them are like quarterback best friend type receivers, right? Um, I was trying to think of a comp. It's funny because they're teammates. I actually think there's a little bit of Kendrick Bourne in him as well, who is another uh, player who I would put in that. Uh, bucket, but yeah, he. I, I think um, like when I think of him, I think of him on playoff teams. If that makes sense, I don't know yeah. where he'll get drafted. I, I actually haven't seen where he's being mocked. I'm guessing it's like somewhere in the second round is probably where mm-hmm. people see maybe the third. Um, but when I think about teams that already have a wide receiver one, I you, you just I can so easily imagine him not only being successful because of his traits, but also being the type of player that's very easy to game plan for. And I think um, I, just, I, can, I can think of a number of teams that are going to be drawn to that skill set, especially just thinking about him in conjunction with, you know, a, a big, a true X. With the three Washington wide receivers, it's fascinating because they're all super talented. They're all going to go pretty high. I would guess that McMillan is probably off the board by about 60, if not about 65, and that means all three of them are gone. Rome, as you said, kind of in his own category. How do you see the differences between Polk and McMillan? Because McMillan's my guy. I like all three. Yeah, I like McMillan a little bit better, and a lot of it's based on what he did in 2022 because, as you said about Polk, he missed a lot of this season. Again, when he came back, you saw some of that spark. But there are differences between Polk and McMillan, and how do you see those? Yeah, I mean, I think usage is going to be a a big difference, I think, in the NFL, just – McMillan being more slot, uh, Polk, I think, having more inside, outside versatility as a, you know, he's like a true Z. Um, I think um, for me, it just keeps coming back to the hands. Uh, you know, like I think with all of these prospects, you have so many who have um, the top three. I think we all agree. It's kind of like a styles makes fights debate. Like they're all yeah. amazing, but like it really comes down to what kind of receiver do you want? But I actually think that extends beyond the first three. We have like all these different players who are like, you know, who is valuable to one team might not be as like Jalen Polk, for example, might be valuable to more valuable to some teams than Xavier Worthy because they don't need speed. They need 
his whatever, you know, the, the traits that I talked about. I think versus McMillan, in addition to the role thing, um, because Polk has like a truly elite trait, I think that's kind of what bumps him for me. Like, mm -hmm. I, I think next to Odunze, he might have the best hands in, I mean, it's up there. It's probably... It, it's, it's up there, you know. Right. Him, like, Marvin, AD. Yeah. Ricky Pearsall. Pearsall, yeah. yeah, you know. Um, and I think that there. just knowing that a prospect is or ha has something that they're better at than everyone, it, it, that's for me what pushes him a little bit above McMillan. Yeah, EJ and I have a saying, uh, the job description is wide receiver. The second word there is, is very important. You better be able to catch the ball. Um, I think, by the way, it, it was on this show. I think we talked about Johnston last year I, on this show. I'm, I'm getting like deja vu. Maybe we can go yep. back. And, and I was <laughs> yeah. like, I think I was just like, dude, I, you got to catch the football. I don't know. And I, I <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I, it's not like that came back to bite the Chargers in any way in particular, right? <laughs> I hope he can get better. But yeah, that it is. Call me crazy. I like a wide receiver who catches everything thrown at him. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> Uh, your, your second gem on the list, this is a running back class that I don't think gets talked about very much. And I think it's because, you know, there's not a Bijan, there's not a Saquon, there's not like the guy who's who's up on the marquee. But there's still a group of like six to seven that are all going to go fairly close to each other. And they're all, they're all kind of different flavors too. The one you chose uh, is basically a human bus to me just don't get in the way you, you'll probably beat him in a drag race but just don't get in the way uh what do you like about Audric Estime human bus is is a good comp because in some ways he actually is a little bit similar to uh Gus bus uh Edwards out of Baltimore yeah. I think he's got a this is my this is a little bit of a it's funny because he was like a seventh round draft pick so it's actually not um at all I, I just because of who he was in the nfl he does remind me a little bit of chris carson too uh, out of seattle um yeah i i, I mean but then that, that that's what i love about him the violence the physicality um you said it all these running backs the ones that i've watched all have kind of a different calling card and i tend to be a sucker for guys who break tackles and uh <laughs> are violent runners and estimate um I don't know where I actually haven't looked at where the running backs are being mocked very often. I know Brooks is kind of seen as running back one by a lot of people, but I don't, so I have no idea, but I um, have been kind of surprised. I, I don't know if people are lower on him or whatnot. I think maybe the lack of um, burst uh, and I, I saw he didn't run a great 40 at the combine. I honestly don't care. Like he looks his speed is, it takes a little bit to ramp up at times and you can but when it does ramp up i think it's plenty fast but beyond that um i see a guy who to me has one of the more complete skill sets in the draft uh amongst the running backs rather and i think you can install in a number of nfl offenses zone gap um i just love the way he place i don't know I, I i like just the aesthetic of it appeals to me <laughs> immensely <laughs> i love that that's a great answer i about running back play especially but he's he's a funny one to me because he does have this sort of power plotter you know persona and then he'll bounce off contact inside and like you said ramp up that speed he had an 80 yarder this year yeah like in one of the early games and then he's got sort of some other hidden skill sets and the one for me is that he's underrated as a receiver he caught every target thrown at him 17 of 17 now you might say oh well he didn't throw it at him very much but it goes back to that classic draft analogy can he and they just didn't ask him to or can't he just can't because they didn't want him to i think he can he's shown that he showed some great hands on tape and the one that cracked me up as i was getting ready for this is his yards per reception and his yak per reception are both 8.4 wow really <laughs> I didn't know exactly, that. Exactly. <laughs> like dead on. Huh, so you're okay. like, okay, has that ever happened before for anybody? But no, I I love the long speed. Um, he's not, like you said, going to accelerate to it immediately. He's not that big burst guy, but he is going to hammer into the middle of the line, manage that through contact balance. And then if you don't get a hand on him outside, look out. He's got enough speed to take it the distance and did several times this year. So he's a fascinating player and he is going to go sort of in that middle bump of 
running backs where teams just start picking their flavor. And I think maybe the reason you haven't seen him mocked is because teams know they can wait. They don't have to go up high. And then there's a bunch of guys that they can choose from. So nobody's like in a hurry to go grab him, despite him being a good and I agree with you, well-rounded player. He just feels like a Seahawks running back of just big, No, we have we have enough. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have enough. Pete Carroll's gonna barge into the draft room. <laughs> Hey. This is my coat for the second we gave away from Leonard Williams. It's going to keep Seattle from drafting a uh, running back with that second rounder that they don't have. <laughs> <laughs> or later even because of the lack of draft capital. Um, yeah, it, I mean, God, he'd be such a – I have to fig- – I mean, I know the Cowboys are a team where you're going to be looking, obviously, at backs around there. I don't know if stylistically – I mean, I – they run inside zone. I mean, they, they run everything in Dallas. Um, I like him as a Thunder paired with a Lightning. So I think ideally you would be a team where you've got like, you know, your Keaton Mitchell HN type to pair with him. Yeah. Um, I, you know, we, we, we mentioned Seattle as a fit for them if they didn't already have Zach Charbonnet. Um, they're kind of an interesting uh, team at 16 because they can go in any direction other than running back. And it feels like you can mock pretty much any player that's going to be in the top 20 to them, and it makes sense for various reasons. Your third gem is somebody who I think sneakily, sneakily is in the running. Yeah. Johnny Newton. Mm. Let's talk about him. Yeah, I see Murphy mock to Seattle a lot. Um, And it (laughs) seems like Byron Murphy is probably going to be taken before I, I, I not just seems I, I would be pretty shocked if he wasn't taken before Newton but I don't think Newton's that far off to be honest um I get the size being a concern but just in terms of like that penetrating three tech who uh plays with such an attacking mentality um I think is you know already pretty advanced as a pass rusher honestly um similarly to Murphy uh, and has that sort of lateral agility. Uh, you can run games with him. You can even line him up inside. I think I posted a clip of him lined up outside versus, I want to say Minnesota, where he um, he closed, He it was a sack. Yeah, it was Minnesota. Yeah, I forget the quarterback's name. But uh, you saw just the closing speed, the hands. He doesn't have an elite first step, and I think that's probably where I, why he's going to go after Murphy. But... Uh, just everything else you would want out of that position other than size. Um, You know, the run defense, I think where he goes will impact how he plays. But I, I, the other thing is something I, you know, I really prioritize or at least privilege in uh, defensive linemen, which is he just took over games. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I Mm -hmm. mean, just going back. And I remember that during the season watching just Illinois, just casually at times, a couple games, but going back and watching the tape, and including that Minnesota game where he comes in at the half, he had that unique ability to be like just a total game wrecker. And um, man, if Seattle doesn't take him at 16, I got to think the Rams ha- would have some interest. He, uh, the, the thing that I like about him, and again, I go back and forth on, on Murphy versus Newton, because again, it, it depends on the team, right? It depends what you're looking for. But for a team like Seattle, who we expect, based on history of the coaches, to run probably two high safety structures about half the time, maybe even more than half the time, spending a, a bunch of time in nickel, like Witherspoon, man, if you, if you thought Kyle Hamilton <laughs> was, was an awesome nickel, wait till you see Witherspoon full-time in that spot. Um, but you need to have defensive linemen that can just maul people in the line of scrimmage, and I feel like Newton does that. He, his play style is just overwhelming. And there, I think there are certain teams that might prioritize that more than, say, an undersized three technique. But again, it just depends on on who we're talking about. I have to imagine he's going to go somewhere in the top 20. I'd be stunned if he didn't. But if he somehow went after the top 20, I, I just sprint the pick in, to be honest. Yeah, he's got so much use and wins in so many ways. And you even saw it last year. I know you love that Illinois defense last year, Mina. We talked about that when you were on last year. And you could see it then. You knew he was coming. Like, I was telling people, like, yep, just wait. Johnny's coming. Like, And he feels like a continuation of that defense, like a consistent carryover from how that entire Illinois defense felt last year, which was just 
openly aggressive and kind of set to attack mode. Every play is in there. You talked about his ability to wreck games. Funny Byron Murphy story. I was uh, DMing with Matt Miller as I got on my flight to the combine and Schneider was on the same flight. And I said, hey, Matt, John Schneider's on this. And he's like, airdropping pictures of Byron Murphy. <laughs> I was <laughs> like, I don't think I'll be doing that, but OK. So there's your your fun Byron Murphy Seahawks connect. Yeah, we'll see. Um, your point about McDonald and that defense is important because um, that Ravens defense uh it is so elite up the spine, right? Uh, which mm-hmm. is unique uh, in prioritizing positions that have really been sort of under prioritized by the rest of the NFL, where uh, the last 10 years have been all about, you know, edge and corner. And with Baltimore saying, no, 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 we're going to be really, really good at defensive tackle, linebacker, and safety. Uh, and then we're going to um, play a lot of split safety and obviously run a lot of sims, but uh, we're going to count on those elite players to be dominant. I'll be very interested in seeing how Seattle approaches that build because right now uh, you got two linebackers on one year deals. Um, mm-hmm. You already have an elite nickel, obviously. Safety, they go out. Um, bringing Rayshon Jenkins. I still think there's there might be work. There's still a lot of safeties out there in free agency, so we'll see what they do. And then they already are paying uh, Leonard Williams and Draymond Jones a lot of money, uh, which yeah. might actually make – it makes me wonder if as much as we're giving them defensive tackle, they might be looking at edge. And uh, maybe that's a good transition to <laughs> the uh, one of the other guys. I was going to say, Leatu Latu, your fourth gem – uh, another guy who's probably going to go somewhere in the in the top twenty five ish. But to your point from earlier in the show, you mentioned you see him hit the twenties regularly. Yeah. Do you feel like he's being undervalued relative to, to how good he is? If he falls below twenty five ish, absolutely. Maybe even below earlier than that. And the fact that he keeps dropping in my dra- my mocks to me is just about the teams and obviously the players, the offensive players we talked about. But um, I did a team needs pod with Trevor Sikama before I started getting into the draft. And at the end, it, it's a fun exercise because you realize like you're like, okay, a lot of teams need tackles, right? Offensive tackles. And at the end, I was like, damn, not that many teams need edge rushers. And I was really surprised after going through it. And then so you get to the draft and suddenly you're like, oh, yeah. And because of that, these edges are kind of falling. I had verse falling as well. Um, So, you know, some teams incredible gain because Laotilatsu is a hell of a football player. I actually um, didn't intend to watch him as early as I did. My process is right after the Super Bowl, I start watching the quarterbacks first because we go into the combine Mm -hmm. and we're going to talk about the quarterbacks. So I start with Caleb Williams. I put on, you know, I'm going, <laughs> you're laughing because I, I put on UCLA. Yep. And at some point I just had to stop. And I was like, all right, I'm just going to watch Live 2 Lost You. Fuck it. Because he's so, <laughs> I mean, he was an unbelievable in that game. Mm-hmm. Unblockable. Not the greatest offensive line, obviously. But um, I just fell in love with his tape. Uh, he's just so goddamn polished like i just yeah. you know and and this is always the battle with edge rush evaluation is athleticism versus, versus polish i think he's a good athlete too but it i mean it, to see a prospect with that diverse and developed a pass rush arsenal is rare and it is really special that's the thing about latu for me is when I keep coming back to him, I watched him fairly early. He was a player that we saw even a couple of years ago and got excited about when he finally came out. I was like, great. And I watched him first, and I feel like that was a huge disservice because then every edge I watched yeah. after that, I was like, oh, well, it's not as good as Latu. <laughs> and when I go back to his tape now, the thing that catches me is not that he's better at all of the things than all of his contemporaries. It's how much better. When you look at the difference between pressure rate, when you look at the difference in the way that he finishes or the way that he continues throughout a down with counter moves, which is something that I feel like I write in college edge rush tape all the time. No, it says, hey, he could use a counter move like he could use air. With Latu, he's got four of them and he uses them all the time to great effect. And so it's that distance of how much better he is than everybody else in this class. I was going to ask you, I'm really glad you brought that polish up. Is there another DL or edge prospect you can remember that you felt was this polished coming out? Because he is like, I I completely agree with the assessment of rare. You just don't see what he has very often. 
You know, when I think back to the edges taken in recent years, Hutchinson um, comes to mind, Anderson Jr. last year, they all had like one or two moves where I was like, oh, that, you know, they're, 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 that's good. That's going to translate to the NFL. Like, oh, okay, his cross chops there, the spin is there, the club is there. I think, though, I with Latu, it, to, to what you, your point, and it's just the pure array of them is actually pretty hard. I, I might be suffering from recency bias, but I'm trying to think of someone. Honestly, I felt more that way about Campsy than the edge rushers last year, where I was like, oh, yeah, yeah got the bag, you know? Um, yeah, I'd have to look back. Maybe, maybe Bosa, maybe. Okay, so if we're going, yeah, way back, yeah, that would, it would be Bosa. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really. And I, I don't think that's a comp a lot of people are making. No, right? no. There, but, but just same seems same feet, to have same slid. Hips. Yeah. And I, I think you're both right. Like, it, you do go back to players who were in that rare air, and Latu's not being mentioned in, in the same stratosphere. And when you look at his tape, you kind of go, well, why? I mean, the injury history is crazy. Like, it is For sure. junior level. For oh, sure. my God, when you see it all written down and, <laughs> and you know, it's, you get it. Like, so, and, yeah. you know, that's why, I, like, I think that. And then um, I do think he's underrated as athlete, but I do think the length and, you know, it's, it's yep. um, but again, like, we've seen so many guys in recent years with, you know, I, I hate to um, dump on Trevon Walker, but I'll take the guy who can rush the passer at this point you know i i just it's like the wide receiver debate the job yeah. the job is you got to get it done and yes lot two gets it done yes well i mean even in that same class walker had i think 34 and a half inch arms and aiden had 32 and a half and mm -hmm. look look who's worked out right yeah. some guys they just they just know how to weaponize what they do have uh and you know that's that's what i find interesting about lot two is you know, he does have such a, a wide array of, I guess you'd call him finesse-based move, not not power-based moves. He doesn't really have bull rush because he doesn't have the length. But normally when we see guys that have as deep of a bag as him, it's because they have to, as in they're not really athletic or gifted in yeah. anything. Whereas Latu's got a 70th percentile three cone, a 70th percentile shuttle. Like, he actually is a good athlete. He's not an elite yeah. athlete, but he's a good athlete. And then when you when you throw the moves on top of that, it's like, oh yeah, that's why he has a twenty percent win rate or something right. like that, which is insane. So, uh, yeah, it's what, it's what happens when uh, when just enough talent meets polish is you get a first round pick. Totally agree. Uh, last gem here, Lad McConkey. I want to throw a comp at you. Okay. That I've gotten a little bit of pushback on, but in my head, in my head canon, this fits. Okay. Emmanuel Sanders. It's so funny because um, Mike Renner on my show said Antonio Brown, which is way more dramatic. Whoa, whoa. I know, but, the, but they're teammates, and it's like, all right, let's just keep running through Steelers. Um, yeah, I, they're probably about the same size, right? I, I almost exactly. Yeah, um, I think there's definitely some similarities there in the route running, the shiftiness, um, catch radius that belies the size at times. Um, yeah, I could see that. I, I wonder maybe like long speed might be a little bit different, but that's, I, but you know what? Like after the catch, Wakaki's plenty fast. I could see that. Yeah. I've had trouble coming up with comps for mm -hmm. him. Um, you know, uh, very endeavoring not to <laughs> pick any, uh, of the, uh, stereotypical comps there. No, um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, just it's so funny so uh i haven't been doing panthers picks uh and a panthers fan said please 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 do a pick for a 33 so i said all right so we ended up doing mcconkey to the panthers and then i went back and i didn't read the second half of the panthers fan he, he wrote other than lad mcconkey because <laughs> <laughs> I, I i'm sorry it would be a great pick for them it makes sense Oh, he is exactly what they need, which is a guy who gets open and gets open quickly, right? And I think, um, you know, I, he is one too, where like other than size, I don't really think, and you know, so that size translates in physicality, both at the line of scrimmage and at the top of his route. So it's a real thing, you know, and he's obviously mm -hmm. small, but uh, it just in terms of like the route running, getting open, 
Um, the way he makes himself available to quarterbacks, the way he attacks defenses, he's so good against both man and zone. I just, if I was a, a coach in the NFL, I would want him on my team because I, you could build so much around him. Um, you know, obviously he's great on option stuff. I, I just, there's a, it's a little bit redundant. It's very different from Polk, obviously, but the, my rationale is a little bit redundant in that both of these receivers aren't like athletic freaks, obviously, but they're both players that I just feel like are going to be good in the NFL. I just, I, I, I would be shocked if either of those two players, unless there's some sort of injury, don't succeed. Uh, and I don't know, maybe that's a boring reason to like a prospect, but when you see them dropping, you know, obviously in the second round or beyond, to me, like, uh, yeah, I'll take a second round who I know is going to be a productive NFL player. Yep. And good quickly, too, which is yeah. really important. And with McConkey, it's more a factor i think that this wide receiver class is extremely stacked i think he would be a shoe in at the bottom of the first round in just about any other year but there's enough receivers and talent above him he's so efficient he caught 83.9 percent of his targets but they just didn't throw it to him very much he had 31 regular season targets which is the thing that kills me about mcconkey everybody's like everybody's like wait he's a target magnet and i was like well, sort of. I mean, he does get open all the time, and he should have probably been thrown to more. If you watch the tape, there's definitely routes he wins where Carson Beck doesn't throw it to him. Um, but he's just the efficiency is second in this class in yards per route run, only behind neighbors for receivers with, again, 30 targets. Neighbors is 3.81. McConkey's 3.62. So he does a lot with the targets that he gets. He's always open, which is the the thing that's been sort of, I think, predominantly talked about throughout his evaluation. But he's really smart. There's some plays on his tape. There's one against Vandy where the quarter, the cornerback is like, you're in the slot and I am not giving you inside leverage. I am literally like three-quartering myself. You are not coming inside on me. McConkey's routes inside. He knows it. Gives him a little jab step and then just runs around, turns his hips and runs right behind him. And, you know, if he tried to run through him, you wouldn't have been open in the window the quarterback needed, which is what you talked about, making himself available to the quarterback. So I just think it's a I think with extra volume, you're just going to see him keep winning in the same ways. Now, he's not the biggest guy, as you mentioned. He's not great in contested catch. He's not super good for Yak if he gets loose, he is. But in terms of that, what everybody craves in the NFL on time, on target, on structure. Will you be where I need you to be? Will you catch the ball if I throw it to you? Will you, you know, run a route past the sticks at third and six? Like he's going to do all that. So when I say be good quickly, he's already got all that. And if he polishes up the other stuff, he could continue to just can be one of those receivers that rises in the rankings. But I'm with you in the second round. That's gold. Like I know this guy's going to fit and I know I don't have to project very much at all. I know exactly what I'm going to do with him from like day one of camp. I, I know everybody wants the Chiefs to add speed and size, but how many balls would he catch if he was a kid? <laughs> a lot. That Especially they would also considering just, recent events. Yeah, well, yeah, God, that certainly has to factor into it with Rise, too. But, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I just think, like, an, the efficiency, to your point, that he brings to an offense, a good offense, like Polk. Different players. Mm -hmm. um, but... That He's already used to wearing red. There I mean, <laughs> before go. we let you go, I, I, I do want to get your reaction to something because we are recording this on the day that Stefan Diggs got traded and where Buffalo willingly took a, I don't know if we've ever seen a dead cap hit like that for a receiver. It's the biggest, yeah. <laughs> ever. Um, what was your initial reaction to the trade for both teams? Yeah, um, Stephen A. was right all along because he's been teasing this forever. Uh, that man has sources. Uh, no, um, so the Texans, obviously, it's a continuation of a theme that they do appear to be all in around Stroud for his rookie contract. I think from a football-only perspective on the field this year, it's freaking awesome for Houston. Um, he fits in so well with the receivers they have. Collins and Dell like though you you if you built three receivers in a lab to play together this is honestly right like what it would look like with with um these three and uh that's really exciting I think that there are however like legitimate reasons why Buffalo moved on beyond the whatever the heck was happening off the field or whatnot um 
one of which is uh, you know, he he wasn't as productive in the second half of last season. That, it was interesting, though, right? Because that production tailing, a lot of it had to do with the way he was used, um, which is to say it was in the second half of the season, around the time that Joe Brady took over as a play caller, um, the Bills r- really used him mostly on, like, screens and deep balls, and kind of that's it. And that intermediate part of his game went away a little bit. I think... The question I have is how much of that is just the offense versus Diggs and their perception of um, whether or not he's a declining player. He's 31. So I think that's real. I also think that contract, like, yes, Buffalo's eating a lot. It's going to be a lot of money. And if, you know, he it, they, they still are taking on a lot of salary and they have to pay Nico Collins. Um, so, you know, I don't think it was like an obvious a plus F type situation. I think it's going to probably take a couple years to see how it shakes out. All I know is in the short term, I'm very excited to watch the Houston Texans and I'm very curious to see what Buffalo does in the draft. I'm a Texans fan. So obviously I'm just, right. I got my blinders on where I'm like, cool, Super Bowl. Let's, let's go. go. <laughs> let's go. I mean, it's so cool <laughs> that they're going all in. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. This only happened like once in our franchise's history. And if Albert Hainsworth didn't step on Matt Schaub's foot, we would have won it in 2011. I swear to God, like I swear they would have won it in 2011. People forget Matt, Sch- Matt Schaub 2011. People forget. Falling. Yep. We were rolling. We were rolling. Um, I want to thank you for coming on, and, and I know this time of year is absolutely insanely busy for you and for you know carving out 45 minutes of your time for us. We appreciate it. Uh, I know the Media Kime Show has its own YouTube channel yes. now, so yes. I encourage everybody to to find the Mina Kime Show featuring Lenny on YouTube. Uh, fast, fast, fast growing channel. It's oh, a wonder what thank happens you. Well, they... Brett, you gave me some advice on because I was like, ah, I'm trying to like get better at this YouTube thing, and uh, you've been you guys have been at this much longer than I have, so I appreciate. Unfortunately, I didn't get the advice on making sure my camera always looks great. I, you guys have like the the <laughs> most amazing shots in the game, and I'm like weirdly pinched right now. I don't know what's going on with my camera, but yeah, no, I I really appreciate it. It's been really fun um, to do stuff like these mock drafts that we've been doing and uh, assorted kind of draft content and free agency content so yeah if you're definitely want you guys to come on and um if you're watching this it's youtube.com slash admina kinds want to thank mina for coming on once again a uh, great interview as always uh before we get out of here ej uh, i i forgot to make one point when she was here and i want to get your thoughts on it go for it considering all the losses that we've seen from the Bills this offseason. I understand it was mostly older players, some guys coming off injury, some guys who just have a tendency to get injured. Uh, like I, I understand all the moves that the Bills made individually. Uh, I also understand that they've, uh, you know, got some young guys in the pipeline that can, you know, perhaps alleviate some of those losses. But it does kind of feel like they're. It's not a rebuild. Uh, it does kind of feel like they're treating 2024 as a reload hmm. to position themselves to to get back into this thing in 2025. They're not going to be bad. In, in It's in, almost impossible to be bad if you have Josh Allen as your quarterback, um, let alone they have a bunch of other talent we like. But it does kind of feel like they acknowledge that 2022 and 2023 was kind of like the most open the window was going to be with the current iteration or former current iteration of the bills. And so they're jettisoning some, some, uh, some older players, some expensive contracts. They're eating a bunch of dead money now to, I think just kind of rip the bandaid off. And again, not a rebuild, more of a reload, but I think they're trying to position themselves to, to really attack this thing, you know, spend a bunch of money in 2025, attack the next two drafts, and, and try to acquire a younger, cheaper um, supporting cast around Josh Allen so that the window really doesn't slam shut and only just slightly closes a little bit before it opens wide back open in 2025. What do you think about that? I agree with most of what you said. I just think the amount of time that you're allotting to said reload is shorter than you may think. This was these are clearly moves that Buffalo made to keep Josh's window open. They are taking a page out of their rival's playbook in Kansas City. 
and saying, nope, we've we've got what we want. We've got our quarterback in place. We've got the quarterback contract in place. We are going to have to find ways to shuffle along. And what you said about the previous iteration, really, they invested in that and that was what they saw as a high point. And I think this is the acknowledgement, certainly, that that is done, that that is over, that they do need to shift. But I don't think they're going to take a year to make that shift. A, I don't think Brandon Bean is done. So we will see. Certainly they have the draft to come, but there might be another addition as well. And that could make the landscape look very, very different very quickly. And I think that they are imagining that they're going to hold ground, not give ground this season and be again near the top of the AFC. And if they can get into the playoffs and they have Josh Allen, they've got a shot. Might not be their best shot, but it is I would say, an equally solid shot to what we saw last year. So I don't think they're going to sort of give a year to like, hey, we're just going to, you know, the Bears a couple of years ago clearly gave a year. They were just like, nope, we're going to eat all the dead money. We're going to start the reload. We're really not going to be trying for another year. I don't think this is like that at all. And I think it could be very, very short. I mean, let's just say Brandon Bean to say, decides to say, hey, we'll give you San Francisco, we'll give you our pick at the end of the first round. We'll take Brandon Ayuk and we'll work the money out. Like at that point, and then draft a wide receiver later on as well, because they don't need one. They need two after what they've done. Yeah. But at that point, you kind of go, huh? And that's how quickly it could turn. So if a team is only one big move or one trade away from being really holding their ground, which was at the top of the AFC last year, um, it, it I think that <laughs> that reload period might be a little bit shorter, a little bit quicker. I don't think Bean's done yet. I, I I have to assume there would be a way through some creative restructures or extensions or something to open up enough money to figure out an IUK deal. And if they do that, all right, I'm all the way back in. Um, <laughs> Instantly. But like that would be really hard to do and also uh, very expensive in terms of draft capital given up. Not right? saying it's going to be easy and I'm not <laughs> saying it's going to be clean. But again, if you're that close, if it's one move, tilts it away. They definitely need what they had in Stefan Diggs. I said this on Twitter. They need that X. They need the guy that oh, it's third and seven. It's going to be press man. You got to beat it to win the game. We're going to throw it that guy's way no matter what. And he has to catch it more often than not. They need that guy. They don't have him currently on the roster. They have a lot of really interesting kind of twos and threes on the roster, but they make no mistake. They need that number one. They probably need a strong candidate for future number two undisputed. Um, they thought they were going to have that in Gabe Davis. Never really worked out that way. Might, might have adult. it in Khalil Shakir. We'll uh, see. Might have it in Khalil Shakir. I feel like he's sort of more of an ideal three in a lot of ways for the skill set that he has. And you can consider Dalton Kincaid a two if you want to. Like, there's creative ways to do this. But if they added that one player, because obviously there's a, a gaping void there now with Diggs heading out of town, um, how how would you feel differently right now? If it's Ayuk, I understand it's one way. If they trade up, right? If they package a bunch of those picks and trade up and get one of the big three wide receivers how would you feel like you know hey they're right back <laughs> well, they'd have to give a hell of a lot i understand like if, Speaking, if rome if rome it's got gonna be to expensive nine. anyway it's gonna be expensive in yeah. draft capital it's gonna be expensive in money if it's iu because you gotta pay him like it's gonna be expensive but if they sort of push their chips to the middle and say we want to maximize this window we don't want to just kind of spend a year of josh's career like reloading Again, if you could do it with one player, you're closer than a lot of other teams. How I look at it is there's still a playoff team, mm -hmm. right? But I think there's, there is a difference between being a team that you're very confident is going to make the playoffs, which mm -hmm. they are, even, even after the losses, right? That's what I'm saying. Yep. It's not a rebuild because a rebuild means like you're not a playoff yeah. team. <laughs> you're not doing It's not that. a rebuild. But... I think it takes a reload to go from playoff team to Super Bowl contender, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's kind of what the Chiefs did, like you said, with, with the Tyreek thing. It's like that would that was a reload move. It was a choice. That was like, hey, Mag's empty. Let's get a new one in there, right? Okay, yeah, we're going to go a different Tyreke. way. Yeah. yeah, 
and, and we'll get a bunch of picks. We'll free up a bunch of money. We'll keep our core together. We'll draft uh, Trent McDuffie. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like that, whole bunch of other guys. That's what that was, right? So yeah. I, I see them as a playoff team now. That's going to be if they if they execute this correctly. A playoff team now that's going to be a championship contender again in 2025. But like I feel like they're I feel like they might have to eat it a little bit in the wild card of the divisional round this year because I I it's a good team. But when I stack it up against mm-hmm. like what what Kansas City still has, I mean this is the weakest Kansas City's been and they won the fucking Super Bowl, right? But if you're stacking them up against what what Kansas City's got, you know what Baltimore, in my opinion, still has. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're stacking them up against dare I say Houston now, ironically, sure. on the other side of the deal. Again, they'll be there in January. I just don't have the confidence of, of, of past years where I'm like, they could be there in February. And I think there's a there's a, a difference between those two tiers of, mm-hmm. of top teams, right? So, I don't know. That's how I look at it. I think it was a good trade for Buffalo, honestly, because they, I think they recognized yeah. the problem before it became a really big problem. <laughs> they got what they could out of it. And I think this is probably the best thing they could do for the long-term health of the franchise. And then for the Texans, like, even if it's a one-year, two-year rental, like, who cares in a rookie quarterback window? Like, it's what you're supposed to do, right? Yeah, surround them with weapons. It's so cool to see a team say, nope, we know what we've got, and we are literally taking the throttle and just pushing it to the firewall. We are we are all in. We are 100% go. We're going to do everything we can to just keep this – uh, somewhat surprising momentum that we got in our very first year with a lot of change. We know what's there. We're not going to hesitate. This is not a you know slow and steady. This is a we're going right now and we're going to go as far as we can. Uh, all right, that'll wrap it up for today's show. Uh, I want to thank uh, all of our executive producers for uh, for Bootleg Football on their Patreon. Iken, Consti, Andrew, Liam, Connor, and Mike L. Appreciate all of you guys for helping to make this show possible. Once again, um, hope you guys are also excited for the draft. I, I, I know you're all going to be joining us on the stream. We'll be live for 17 to 18 hours ish from that corner right back there. Uh, so whether you're an EP or you're somebody who's just stopping by, make sure to come by on draft weekend. Uh, also, if you're interested in either supporting us or supporting your favorite NFL team, you could check out our clothing partner, Homage, who has an NFL license as well as the license to uh, to do bootleg apparel. Anything you buy from the link below, whether it's our stuff, NFL stuff, college football stuff, uh, national park stuff, point break stuff, like whatever you want to buy, uh, we get a cut of if you use the link below. So thank you once again to Homage for working with us as well. Um, next episode is... Who is our next interview? <laughs> At this point. Oh, it's DJ. <laughs> it's DJ. <laughs> now that I Probably, think about it. <laughs> like, depending on how it comes out, it's not that DJ is not at the at the summit of the whole draft game because we believe he is uh it's more so that our brains are just completely scrambled because these all don't get filmed in order so um no definitely looking forward to the rest of the guest list we are going to power out through april very very strongly head towards the draft we've got some fun draft announcements coming from homage in the next week or two so be looking for those as well um and then yeah before we know it i'll be back down there and we'll be sitting on your couch watching more football like when has that ever happened we'll be back uh semi shortly with something else and until then later